the late 1990s, researchers began studying the use of embryonic stem cells to treat or cure diseases. Right out of the starting gate, it generated controversy. And more than two decades later, society doesn't seem to be any closer to achieving a consensus about the ethics of this practice. So let's unpack the issue and apply some ethical wisdom to this cutting-edge medical research. First, what is a stem cell? Well, stem cells are undifferentiated cells. That means they haven't yet been assigned a specific job. They can renew themselves and can grow into different types of specialized cells, like those in muscle tissue or skin or blood. Stem cells are crucial because they help replace the cells in our body that wear out. They also have enormous potential to help treat or cure diseases, from Alzheimer's to diabetes to cerebral palsy. Stem cells can be derived from many sources, including the common tissues of the adult human body. They can be found in our skin, bone marrow, fat tissue, and liver. Other sources include the blood from umbilical cords and the placenta. These are categorized as adult-type stem cells, and they've been used successfully to treat millions of patients. Importantly, there really isn't much ethical controversy surrounding the use of adult-type stem cells, and that's largely because you don't have to harm a human being in order to extract them. The ethical disputes all revolve around stem cells that are derived from human embryos, also known as embryonic stem cells. The harvesting of stem cells from human embryos occurs very early in their development, at about five to seven days after fertilization. This process always results in the young embryo's destruction, and therein lies the controversy. Suppose for a moment that I, desiring to advance stem cell science, decided to become a stem cell donor. I give my consent to have scientists extract stem cells from my fat tissue. Fortunately for me, they're capable of obtaining the cells they want without killing me. But it's entirely different with embryonic stem cells. The early embryo isn't capable of giving her consent. And the process of removing the stem cells is fatal 100% of the time. Of course, advocates for embryonic stem cell research argue that what is destroyed is either not a human being, or at least not a human person. That is, it's not an intrinsically dignified being with natural rights who deserves our care, concern, and protection. It's easy to see, then, that this debate raises the same fundamental questions as abortion. When does human life begin? What does it mean to be a human person? And when does a human person have a right to life that all of us are bound to defend and protect? Now, the first question can be dealt with easily. Any biology textbook confirms that a unique human life begins when a human sperm and human egg unite to form a human zygote. This new life is a genetically unique individual with 46 chromosomes. It's also a self-directed organism, and that's important because it means it begins developing and growing larger and more complex on its own, without being directed by any other organism. To put it simply, the offspring of human beings are human beings. They're not dogs or cats or mice. So some people then argue that the early embryo, while biologically human, is not a human person. They say it's just a clump of cells and has no moral worth or legal protectability. Of course, that begs the question, well, what is it that magically qualifies some biological human beings as human persons while others are just blobs of cells. I mean, is it really just a matter of what we look like? Why should I have more worth and rights than a human at an earlier stage of development just because I'm biologically shaped and physically configured differently? For example, take a look at this picture of a human baby. When I compare myself to this baby, the cells of my body are far more numerous and have developed into more complex structures, especially my brain and my nervous system. But this baby and I are not members of a different species. We are, in fact, the same person. The man in the picture is my father, and the baby is me at about six months. If someone were to have killed me the same day this photo was taken, they would be charged with murder. If someone were to kill me today, they would be charged with the exact same crime. That's true even though I'm far more biologically advanced and physically capable than I was when I was six months old. In most cases, our law wisely recognizes that the value of a human life is not measured solely by external appearances, physical capabilities, mental capacity, 
or what we may have achieved in our life so far. Now here's an illustration of a one-week-old human embryo. Perhaps you might say, as many do, what just looks like a blob of cells, and you would be right. But you might also say, ah, it looks like Albert Einstein, or it looks like Queen Elizabeth, or better yet, hey, that looks like me, and you would also be right. Because this is what you and I and every other human being who ever lived on this planet looked like when we were one-week-old embryos. There's a fundamental ethical principle that can help bring clarity to the worth and dignity of an early human embryo. It's called the principle of full human potential. It reminds us that every human being or group of human beings like embryos deserve to be valued according to the full level of development that person could achieve if given the opportunity, not according to the level of development currently achieved. This principle was famously articulated in the 16th century by Bartolomé de las Casas, a historian, social reformer, and Dominican priest. As a Spanish colonist in the New World, Las Casas was a slave owner, but over time he became convinced that slavery was a profound evil. He gave up his slaves and became a tireless advocate for defending the rights of the natives of the New World. Defenders of slavery argued that the Native Americans were inferior barbarians, who by their very nature deserved to be slaves. They pointed to their lack of knowledge of the sciences, of mathematics, and the fact that they didn't even have a written alphabet. Against these arguments, Las Casas argued that although the Native Americans had not achieved the same level of technological and civilizational advances as the Europeans, they certainly were capable of these achievements, if only they were permitted the time and opportunity to do so. Now fast forward to the 21st century, and we should be able to clearly see the pitfalls of linking the concept of human rights with our stage of physical or mental development, or our accomplishments. When I was an early embryo, I had not attained the level of development that I had when I was a six-month-old baby. But obviously, when I was a baby, I had not attained the level of physical and mental development that I enjoy now. Looking ahead in time, if I live to a very old age, it may be the case that I'll experience diminished physical and mental capabilities. If that occurs, will I somehow be less human than I am now? Or less worthy of personhood? No. Because the principle of full human potential reminds us that we all deserve to be valued according to the full level of human development. Which, of course, begs another question. What is the full level of human development? In other words, what is the highest potential of all human beings which defines our worth as persons? Regardless of what we may have achieved or failed to achieve, our intrinsic worth as human beings is rooted in something more fundamental. Our potential to give and receive love. The potential to give and receive love is found in a seven-day-old embryo, in a newborn baby, a rambunctious teenager, a middle-aged adult, a retired senior citizen, and a frail elderly person in the final chapter of her earthly life. Your potential to give and receive love in an infinite number of ways is what makes you infinitely valuable. And that infinite value is what grounds your right to life. Now, if that's true, we cannot look at an early human embryo as something we are free to experiment on and destroy, regardless of whatever noble intentions we may claim. Stem cell research has led to amazing treatments that have already saved many lives, and we should pray that this research continues and helps alleviate human suffering. But this progress can and must be achieved using stem cells that are obtained ethically in ways that do not harm the person from whom they are taken. Obtaining stem cells from human embryos amounts to saying that we are free to kill some innocent human lives in order to save others. And we need only look to history to understand that that kind of reasoning never leads to a happy ending. Medical scientists and researchers must be held to the same duty to respect the intrinsic dignity of every human life that we expect from the rest of society. Acknowledging this dignity in unborn human life is a step in the right direction toward ethical research that we can be proud of.